Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 330, the Primates Edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Tuesday, the 3rd of October, 2017. It's the Feast of, of George Bell, who was Bishop of Chichester, uh, and that's a whole nother story in the Church of England, which we mustn't uh, ignore or forget. <laughs> Amen. Okay, this is our second try at taping. Uh, we're taping kind of early in the morning for Kevin, and uh, it's allergy season, and uh, it's weirdly warm today. It's gonna be 71 degrees, which is 15 Celsius. How's the weather over there in England, Kevin? It's just dropping, Kevin. It's been very mild, and um, it's now about seven degrees. But I'm keeping a very close eye on on the weather because um, I have a motorbike. And, and I like I like driving around on my motorbike. And we got a very important meeting on Thursday. It's the uh, it's the English Unity Forum, and I'm planning to go on my motorbike. But if the weather drops under a certain a certain level, it it, it gets quite chilly on on the on the yes, fingers and the toes. <laughs> <It's> so <true. laughs> so I'm I'm uh, keeping a very close eye, hoping it'll it'll hold up just a little bit for my for my trip. You know, I, I picture you on a, a bike from Easy Rider. Are we talking Harley Davidson or? Well, I've seen a picture of Archbishop Foley Beach on a very oh, impressive yes, motorbike, and, and I'm afraid I don't have that kind of um, pull. So uh, mine's a very nice Piaggio. It's a scooter because That's I right. work on the basis that I, I've been knocked off motorbikes in the past, and I don't like the idea of your legs getting chopped off. So mm -hmm. I think on a scooter, you know, if you hit a side impact, it means your legs are just a little bit um, further out of reach of the car bonnet. Uh, and it's a, it's a 350, but a Piaggio 350 today is a a great deal more powerful than a 350 was 20 years ago. So it, um, when, when I was driving it home for the first time, I thought, I'm being really buffeted around. These Italians have not done the aerodynamics very well. And then I looked down and saw I was doing 90 miles an hour. <laughs> wow. I slowed up. <laughs> yes. it, it, I slowed up very quickly. Uh, it was my fault, not theirs. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right. So some of the primates have decided to gather in Canterbury at the behest an invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Um, and Justin decided, or his his press office decided, why don't we get you out there to do some interviews? You know, we'll set you up with the Guardian, the Telegraph, the BBC, GQ. And uh, uh, just let you talk about the upcoming primates meeting, some of the difficulties we're having in the communion. Here, we'll give you a list of five things to talk about. That Don't, don't, at all go off these five things and uh he did his interviews and today we're talking about um just his interview before we get to the the meaty stuff uh uh his basic interview was uh the crisis in the church may not be solvable this division uh may there may be no solution to the division that's a, a fair response it's a very hard thing for him to say because his great skill is in mediation uh, and mediation is predicated on the idea that you can square the circle. Um, there should be no conflict of principle that you can't somehow bring together. So actually, I, I think this is a very important moment indeed. Um, although I think Justin Welby has known this for some time, after all, David Porter is on record some years ago now as saying, we're not going to fix this, we'll, we'll, we're ready to lose up to 20% of the Church of England. People, people aren't, aren't remembering that anymore, but they knew this from the beginning. So although he's saying it afresh now, uh, it, it's been part of the understanding within Lambeth Palace for some time. You, know, you, have, to, you have to decide, uh, is sex outside marriage a sin or isn't it? Um, it's like being, you know, you can't be halfway pregnant. It's either a sin or it isn't. Um, and, and finally, the Archbishop has said in public that he can't mediate this one. And, you know, to his credit, he tried. And, you know, that's what you, you need to do is try. Um, no, nobody faults him for that. But in the end, um, I would be careful which side I'm uh, leaning toward. And that's kind of the trouble I have with his interview. Uh, he has difficulty in describing kind of the anthropology of man and sexuality uh, and God's desire for man in marriage and uh, 
sex. And it came to the point where the interviewer said, what do you think about gay sex? Is it really, really wrong? And I'm, you know, hyperboiling here. And he says, I don't know. Yes. I mean, actually, one has to feel quite sorry for him. He, 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 he made a classic error, really. The interviewer said, you know, Archbishop, is gay sex a sin? And, and the answer was, I'm not sure I can give you a straight answer to that. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, actually, since I, I have a record for misspeaking myself, I ought to be feel very sorry for it. And I, I rather do. But it was just, it was, I think, not the moment to make, to make that mistake. But nonetheless, it's made us all smile. But the most important thing is um, the Archbishop, the Guardian of the Faith, uh, is asked whether something is a sin or not, that the Bible is very clear about. Uh, and he said, I can't, I can't give you an answer. Well, that's a very serious problem. No, it is. I mean, if the interviewer said, do you fully understand the concept of the Trinity? And if Archbishop Justin just sat back and said, oh, I don't get the whole concept, but I know it's real. That's it. perfect. That's no big deal. Uh, do you understand the virgin birth? I can't really, comp I don't grasp it as, as much as I want to, but I know it's real. Yeah, it's a pass. No big deal. You know, mysteries of the faith, you got it. Get but boy, you know, something the church has not, the church doesn't struggle with this. Scripture is clear. Tradition is clear. Science is clear. You know, anthropological studies are clear. Uh, erotic gay sex is horrid to the human body, the human race, and the church. And boy, you, you, you got to get that one, Justin. Well, if I may say so, Kevin, I, I, looking at his article, which wasn't very long, um, and, and it was expressed in fairly straightforward language, the Archbishop made four fairly serious mistakes. Um, and um, and it, I mean, it really matters a great deal, but they're, they're quite interesting mistakes because they, they, they bring us to the heart of the debate. And I think, I think they're important because they're, they're part of the language and the discussion that everyone is involved with in this. So the first one was that he, he, he introduced again the idea that is the platform on which progressive secularism is based, that what matters is not the category, but the quality of relationship. Um, there are two problems with this argument. The first is it's mistaken. Uh, all the research is that, that, that gay relationships are less stable, more violent, and less permanent. So um, they, um, they do not have... Uh, the quality that heterosexual relationships have, statistically speaking. But, but worse than that, the idea that you prefer quality to a category when the category is given by scripture is really quite important. Uh, let's take, for example, the abortion. Uh, if a woman gets pregnant and she finds that by being pregnant, it seriously interferes with the quality of her life, then on the archbishop's argument, the quality can be improved by losing the child. So lose the child. Um, the same thing with euthanasia. If someone is ill and in pain and, and uh, near the end of their life and their quality of life is, is really impaired, well, let them die. Then there's no longer a problem with their quality of life. But in both these cases, the category is that you, you do not commit abortion, you do not commit murder. So you can't just uh, set quality of experience against category of, in, in Revelation and say, we're going to prefer one to the other. It's a really serious error. Uh, the second mistake he made was to talk, uh, at one point he introduces a notion of polygamy. He says, well, I do recognize, in actually rather an endearing paragraph, I recognize there are lots of people who really do believe that marriage is only between a man and a woman. Uh, and then he, he goes back pre-Christian times in, in Jewish tradition, uh, though sometimes it was with lots of women. And you think, why introduce polygamy at this point? It's, it's like, for example, if we were talking about violence, we say, well, you know, maybe, maybe a Christian doesn't need to turn the other cheek because once upon a time, there's violence in the earlier part of the Bible. Um, any first year theology student knows this progressive revelation. Um, but, but it's important because the next argument by progressive cultural warriors is going to be in favor of polygamy and in favor of polyamory. And so for an archbishop to slip in while there's polygamy, so, you know, that muddies the waters, it's a, it's a worrying indication about the direction his mind 
is taking and, and the lack of clarity of thought, I think. And, and then the third, you want, you want to stop me? Well, I, I did, I'm not going to stop voice. you, but uh, I, I did want to, you know, introduce this, the seventies concept of God is love. Um, therefore good people get into heaven. And I think, you know, there's this, this realm within the church of people who don't understand that the, the level that God is using is not good. The level he uses is holy. And um, people like Justin Welby, if asked about you know gay sex, certainly could be asked, well, do, gay, do good people get into heaven? And that's not the level, that's not the measure. It, it's, not, it's not the right question. Uh, the other day I heard, uh, I, I was listening to somebody uh, talk and I was very moved by the, the analysis they gave, just in brackets, they were saying that, um, uh, we have this trouble in English because we only have one word for love, which is what you just alluded to. And in Greek, there are four. There's uh, agape, philia, eros, and storge. Uh, and, and so agape is God, God's love. Eros is romantic love. Philia is, is a love of friendship. And storge is protective family love. The only place you get all those brought together is in heterosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, that's a wonderful defense of the category that God has given us in heterosexual marriage. Um, move it out of heterosexual marriage and any of these loves can go off rogue on, on its own. But in marriage, they all come together. So we have to be a little bit more canny about the way we use the, the notion of love, as well as the way we understand salvation, of course. You're right. Hmm. All right. Can I, can I take yeah, you on to the third? Yes, please. <laughs> move on to the third. Well, I, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I just don't want to lose, you know, no, no, the, the, no. I'm getting, I'm getting old, Kevin, and, and I haven't had enough coffee this morning. I'm afraid of losing my dream. <laughs> you go, sip, sip, sip. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the third thing was, he was saying, I, I, I need to know what it is God is saying to human beings in the 21st century. And, and this is a terrible thing to say, not, not because we don't want to hear what God is saying in the 21st century. But because the implication is that it's different in the 21st to the first. We know what God is saying to people in the first century. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke very clearly. The idea that it might change because we're 20 centuries later uh, is, is this huge heresy that the Enlightenment has produced of social and ethical progress. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of, it's, it's part of the whole liberal culture war. Uh, and uh, it's, it's the idea that somehow human beings are getting better and therefore they can change the rules. In fact, in the Times today, we have a very uh, competent uh, Jewish journalist called Melanie Phillips. And a few days ago, the Archbishop was asked on another radio program, he's often giving interviews, his views, and he said, that, you know, the, the world is getting to be a nicer place. And Melanie Phillips tears her hair out. Uh, she's a Jew and she's very upset about, about what people are doing to Israel, amongst other things. And she just gives this long list of, 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 of anger, bullying, intolerance, and, 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 uh, and violence. Uh, you, you, don't even, you don't need to go to Las Vegas for this. Uh, appalling though that was. Mm -hmm. But the idea that a serious Christian leader can look at the world through these rose-tinted enlightenment glasses and saying, it's getting better. We need to reevaluate what God may be saying in the 21st century. It, it's, it's called Pelagianism, the idea that human beings can make themselves better and, and it shouldn't be found in the mouth of an Orthodox Christian archbishop. It's a really serious mistake. Yeah, that's that's as bad as it gets. Um, Christ himself said, these are the warning signs. And I see the warning signs uh, of the end, end times here. Uh, not, not that I'm going to give you a date, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's getting worse and worse. You know, you mentioned uh, Las Vegas and, and the mass murder, uh, the earthquakes, the hurricanes, uh, the wars. Uh, you know, I don't see how he thinks it's getting better. Uh, except a lot of people say, hey, you know, the, the Cold War is over, the life is better. Uh, that's, that's not the case. Well, even Fukuyama, the historian who wrote, wrote the end of history after the uh, war came down, mm -hmm. uh, imagined for a moment that somehow democracy and enlightenment had hit this wonderful plateau. But, you know, <laughs> what we've been doing to each other in the last 20 years is no great improvement. No. And the history of the 20th century, above all, uh, when we reach levels of violence and murder, uh, unimaginable and mainly perpetrated by secularists, 
the, 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 the people who believed in social progress. That really ought to, uh, uh, to, to, to inform somebody that human nature hasn't changed. I mean, again, the scriptures are very clear. Um, we, uh, we're deeply flawed. We need to be saved by Jesus. We can't save ourselves. And only the Holy Spirit can improve us. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to any real extent. I mean, there are a few self-improvement um, uh, programs of a minuscule nature, but real, but real, real improvement. You know, changing hatred for love, changing unforgiveness for forgiveness. You know, these things require the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Weight so, Watchers, yeah. while good, isn't going to get you to heaven. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so um, during this, into here, we're here with the, the various mistakes the Archbishop made, and the last one of all was he he couldn't resist saying that the one sin he was deeply worried about was homophobia. But, but this again is a category error. It, it's part of the narcissism of the gay culture. Um, the real, you know, it is, hatred is a sin, hatred of any kind. Um, it doesn't matter where you're directed to. And the fact is, um, people who are same sex attracted don't get a particular pass about being hatred. There, there are categories of people uh, who have acted as scapegoats through history uh, who, who've all been hated, but the hatred is a problem. You can't make a special case by one victim group or another. But the, but the Archbishop has swallowed the secular propaganda, which is this particular group, above all others, are victims of hatred above all others, uh, and therefore must be given a special pass. Well, there is no excuse for hatred, but it's part of the damage in the human heart. It's what happens when the devil gets in. Our, our real struggle is with the devil, not with one phobia or another. No, and you know it's it's amazing that we got to this point where he goes out and does these interviews. Now I know why England and Europe is in this causation where nobody's defending the Christians. When I see you know uh, a Christian under attack from the press, the BBC, uh, or arrested on the streets for evangelizing, and that the uh, Canterbury or the Church of England has not come to their defense, I got it. Now I understand. Nobody there really believes in uh, the wholeness that Scripture provides the church from the first century on. I, I, I wish I had the words right in front of me, um, but, but in the newspaper today, Melanie Phillips excoriates the Archbishop for not knowing his own Scriptures. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, you must know that your Bible teaches you that human beings are not perfectible. How is it possible that you imagine that the world is a nicer place? And And... You know, if, if it's said by someone like me, then people can mistake it for, um, oh, I don't know, some kind of uh, um, sour grapes. But, but you know, when it comes from a Jewish journalist um, who, who understands the New Testament and the Old, uh, you know, really the Archbishop, well, heavens above, you know, it speaks for itself. I, I'm getting some strange audio on your side. I've got a hot well, down the hill. Yes. There are a hundred school children ah, who are who are That's exactly what laughing. it sounds like. It's it's um, we live we live in this valley up up the hill, and uh -huh. uh, it's national trust and a, and a wonderful park of for fifty eight thousand acres. Uh -huh. And past our gate go uh, go scores of happy children on their day out from school, and they their, their laughter and their joy comes up the valley, and that's that's what you're hearing at the moment. I, it's very I beautiful. I thought for sure you were going to tell me, oh, by the way, I have grandchildren. I'm just like, what's, <laughs> what's going on? I hear happy children in the background. I want to be there. Uh, okay, it's, well, it's, I'm not over in England right now, and there's a primates meeting going on. Um, a lot of people are worried that uh, the GAFCON primates may be talked into uh, just accepting Justin's way of, you know, we'll just have a good disagreement. You know, this is not going to be an issue that's going to divide our church. But then I look at the list of people who are there, and I'm like, ah, oh, Greg Venables, an Englishman. <laughs> you know, I'm, and, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm praying that he's going to be the adult in the room, Gavin. I'm a huge fan of Greg Venables. He has the most wonderful track record for being faithful to the gospel as a missionary, as a bishop, and as an archbishop. He's just a very, very nice man. Mm -hmm. He's a good man and a very experienced man, too. Now, Greg was um, the, the first Gafcon Jerusalem. Uh, he played no small role in the, uh, in the setting up of Orthodox Anglicanism uh, after the fall of tech in America. Uh, he's got his fingers on the pulse. And one of the things that's going to happen is that with 16 new primates, the Archbishop's staff are not going to be able to um, to offer a less than complete narrative mm -hmm. because 
Greg Venables will stand up and say, look, this is what actually has happened and this is what's happening. Uh, Greg was the headmaster once upon a time and I, I have this I have this um, picture in my mind of, of Greg, the very competent, informed headmaster, um, calling <laughs> Justin Welby to him as... as as well, I, the trouble is, it's not a very respect, respectful picture in my head. But I, I'm, I rel I'm very happy to rely on Greg Venables and to take joy in the fact that the Lord has made him present at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we can rely, I think, uh, on our Lord and on Greg to uh, to achieve certain things. Well, I've talked to him uh, many times, and uh, one of the things he brings is, you know, what I call street cred. I have Gavin on because you give me English street credibility. You know, if we're going to talk about Anglicanism in the Church of England, um, it doesn't do me any good to have only Americans on the show talking about it. I need somebody who's been there. and You need to know the local culture. Don't sure. local, chaplain to the Queen, you can't beat that. Priest Church of England, <laughs> uh, nobody gets that. And so uh, here I am, just a, a great rapport with you, but you, you bring me the street cred. In GAFCON, that's what Archbishop Venable is. He gives you the English uh, street credibility where he can provide the cultural context of growing up in England uh, and the missionary context of taking Anglicanism uh, into the South America. Uh, well, I was going to say he, he doubles the street cred because, of yeah. course, he has all the mission, all the experiences of missionary of crossing cultures, mm -hmm. uh, and so so he's you know he's not going to be easily seduced or misled by. Um, uh, well, uh, people tell me that the primates are still slightly in awe of English culture or English accents or the English establishment. And yeah. um, there's some reason for that. Behind the scenes, we're told that the Archbishop of Canterbury's office is capable of using the Foreign Office to to put leverage, use leverage financially against African Christians. I, I find the thought really very unpleasant. But you're not going to be able to intimidate Greg Venables. Um, so... There's some hope in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't intimidate a, a Global South or GAFCON Archbishop with poverty. That's that's not going to do it. Gavin, I want to thank you for your time. Before the children come rushing into your, your chapel there and invade <laughs> and, and, and pray with you, uh, let me uh, uh, sign out of the program. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashland. and you'll be listening to episode 330 uh, of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, and the only exception to the rule that things don't get better is this program. <laughs>